Father, thank you for uh, bringing us here. Thank you for the availability of your word. It's at our fingertips now, even, uh, even, you know, even not too long ago, you, we had to have a physical book. Now we have physical book, physical Bibles. We have our phones that can pull up the Bible. We have computers who can pull up the Bible. We have audio books with the Bible on it, videos with the Bible being taught and read. It is more available. Your word is more available now to us right this second than in all of human history. And yet, even though it's that available, Lord, when we sit down together as a church and read your word and listen to it, it is a special, special message from you to us. You consistently speak to us and minister to us through your word. So that's what we we're praying for this morning, that you would continue to do that. We don't take that for granted, but we do expect you to speak to us in that way and speak to us by your spirit. We look to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you want to open your Bibles to Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9. The title for our study this morning is We Messed Up. Again. <laughs> we messed up. Again, Ezra chapter 9. This year, I got a gym membership for, I haven't paid for a gym membership since like high school. Uh, in college, we had one on the college campus, a gym. So I haven't like been in the gym since college. <laughs> it's been a lot of years. Be, uh, because at home, I have some like free weights and stuff and enough exercise stuff to keep me busy and that's free at home and the gym you know costs money and so uh it's also very convenient it's right in my garage at home but what i've found is when i'm using the gym equipment at my house it's really easy to quit you know because it's easy to get there and then you're like eh, eh i'm not really feeling it today i'm just gonna go watch TV, you know, like it's easy to just, I don't even put my shoes on sometimes. I go out there and like flip flops and like, <laughs> which is not a safe thing to do, but, but like, that's how easy it is. So going to the gym, you know, I have to dry, I have to like get dressed. I have to get the gym bag. I got to get water bottles all situated. I got to drive like a whole mile and a half to the gym <laughs> and, uh, I got to get out of my car, find a parking spot, get out of my car, walk inside. By the time you're in there, you're like, well, I might as well work out. I, I got this far. I'm not just turning around and going home. I might as well be here. So it's, you know, it keeps me motivated. <laughs> well, now Ezra, who's made it to Jerusalem, since he's here, he might as well do what he came here to do, right? Teach God's word. Last week, Ezra and 5,000 other Israelites made the four-month journey, 900-mile journey from Babylon, which is the place that Israel was exiled to for 70 years. They made that whole journey to Jerusalem, which is the place that had the newly rebuilt temple. The purpose of this journey was so that Ezra could teach the word of God to the people of God. Ezra was a priest. Ezra was an expert teacher of God's word. So the mission God called him to is to make sure that Israel was following God's word. God's word for Israel was also known as the Old Testament law, or we would also refer to it as the Old Testament law. Now this week, Ezra discovers that Israel has been disobeying God's word in a major way. And we'll see Ezra mourn this sin. And we'll see Ezra ask for forgiveness from God for this sin. So we'll start in verses 1 through 2, where Ezra recognizes the sin and the nation and the people recognize the sin that they've been committing. Verse 1, when these things were done, the leaders came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites 
the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed is mixed with the peoples of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers have been foremost in this trespass. So after arriving in Jerusalem, and immediately after they arrived in Jerusalem, they checked in all of their uh, goods that they brought for the temple, and then they worshipped and sacrificed God at the temple. And right after that, Ezra gets to work on the mission he came there for, which is teaching God's word. Now the leaders in Israel heard Ezra's teaching of God's word, and they realized they're not obeying it. They hear this teaching, and ugh, Oops, we're, we're not following that word. Specifically, the Old Testament law forbid intermarriage between Israelites and the surrounding nations in Exodus 34, Deuteronomy 7, and in plenty other places. The reason for Israel not being allowed to intermarry with people from other nations surrounding Israel is that would bring idolatrous influence into the nation of Israel. So you would bring over, if, if you were an, uh, an Israelite male, you would marry a woman from the Moabites, let's say, and you would bring her to Israel, and she would bring with her the idolatry and the culture, the sinful culture and the evil practices of the Moabites. And then your family would kind of have this mixture of your your worshiping God, and you're also worshiping the Moabites' gods, and you have... Uh, Jewish culture, and you also have Moabite culture, and then you'd be raising your children with this like dual faith of uh, the Jewish God and, and the Moabite gods, and then those children would like talk with other children and share their faith, and you and your wife would talk with your husband and wife friends and share the mixture of idolatry, and this idolatry of the Moabites would then spread into all Israel. Now, the Old Testament doesn't forbid all intermarriage between you and someone from another nation, just intermarriage with non-converts. So if someone from the Moabites was to say, I forsake all of the gods of the Moabites, and I want to become an Israelite, and I set all that idolatry, all that sin for culture behind me, and I want to become myself an Israelite and be married to an Israelite and have Israelite children and raise them in the way of God, then that was acceptable. That happens a ton in the Old Testament. Abraham, Jacob, Judah, Joshua, Moses, Boaz, David, all married non-Israelite converts where their wives became Israelites. Now, this is similar to the New Testament command for Christians to not marry non-Christians in 2 Corinthians 6.14. It's for the same reason, that by definition, non-Christians are living in sin and idolatry, by definition, because they're not following the Lord. And so when we marry non-Christians, we're, we're tying ourselves, we're becoming one flesh, becoming unified with non-Christians. An additional concern for marrying non-Israelites is losing the Jewish bloodline. The bloodline sets God's chosen nation of Israel apart from the surrounding nations. The bloodline establishes your tribe. It establishes your role even. The bloodline establishes who are the kings in Israel and who are the priests in Israel and who are the uh, servants in the temple, the Levites in Israel. The bloodline maybe most notably for us, the bloodline of Israel, establishes how the Messiah comes. That the Messiah has to come through a particular bloodline to fulfill prophecy. So if you lose that bloodline, you no longer have a functioning nation of Israel. And you no longer have anywhere for the Messiah to come from. Not to mention that a lot of this bloodline was had been a lot of the nation of Israel had been wiped out in the last couple hundred years. If you remember Israel, the whole nation of Israel, before it was taken captive, was split into two. There's the ten northern tribes of Israel, the two southern tribes of Judah. 
And then 10 northern tribes of Israel are taken into captivity by Assyria, never to be seen again. Now the descendants exist in our world. We just have no idea who they are because their bloodline was intermingled with those who took them captive. And we, we have no way to tell who are the, 12, the 10 tribes of Israel to this day. All of those 10 tribes, gone. Then you have the two tribes of Judah who were taken into captivity by Babylon. God preserved their bloodline, but only a part of it. A lot of them died going into exile. A lot of them intermarried or lost their faith in exile. And so you only have, out of all of what nation of Israel used to be, you only have the remnant of two of the tribes of Israel left over. So they've already been depleted quite a bit. If we let this go on, it would be the end of Israel. So it's actually a good, a really good law in the Old Testament. It protects Israel's spiritual health, which is so important. And it protects their physical lineage so that they can continue to exist. Anyone's welcome to convert to Judaism and be married, but they have to leave all of their idols behind to do so. So in Ezra's case, the Israelites in Jerusalem have intermarried with non-converts from the surrounding nations. And those non-converts brought all of their idolatry, brought their sinful, sinful culture with them, and it starts to corrupt each generation. Corrupts the, the, the parents who are married to each other, the Israelite and non-Israelite marriage. It corrupts them. It corrupts their, the surrounding friends and family. It corrupts the children. It corrupts the friends of the children. Now Malachi 2 seems to indicate that not only did this happen, but it seems like Israelite men were divorcing their Israelite women. The Jewish men were divorcing their Jewish wives in order to marry women from the surrounding nations. Even the leaders of Israel took part in this, which obviously, if the leaders are doing it, it encourages everybody to do it. I remember when they dedicated the temple in Ezra chapter 6, we read through that, Israel committed to stay separate from the surrounding nations and committed to stay holy. In verse 21 of chapter 6, it says, Then the children of Israel who had returned from the captivity ate together with all who had separated themselves from the filth of the nations of the land in order to seek the Lord God of Israel. That's what they committed to do when they dedicated the temple. The temple's finally rebuilt. We dedicate the temple. We commit to, to separate ourselves from the filth of the nations of the surrounding land through these evil, idolatrous practices. So Israel had already started to lose their way. They're not. They're about 60 years removed from that moment. W within a generation from that moment of dedicating the temple, and they've already started to lose their way. How fast sin can cause us to fall when we are not studying and obeying God's word. Without the word of God, the people of God become like the world, the world that doesn't have God. I, uh, I played water polo in high school. I was pretty good. Set some records and stuff for the school. Don't need to toot my own horn. But uh, I had this dream recently slash nightmare <laughs> where I was playing in an, an alumni game. This is something that could totally happen. An alumni game is where the people who have graduated come at the beginning of the season and play the varsity team who's currently in high school. And so I've never played in one of those games before. Um, so I haven't played since high school. So I, I, in this dream, I'm playing the alumni game, but I'm so out of shape that I'm like barely able to keep my head above water. And so all of the pride of, you know, the glory days of high school are just drowned out by this, the crowd of the whole city staring at me, drowning in the water <laughs> with all these high schoolers running circles around me. And I decided I'm never playing in an in a alumni game ever again. 
I was just so out of shape. I feel like I wouldn't be that bad, but there's no guarantee. Might as well not take that risk. Even as Christians, if we take time away from the Word of God, we lose it. We forget things that we once knew. We stop regularly hearing God's voice. We're able to avoid being convicted by God in a way that we really need. Pretty soon we're drowning in our own mistakes. Or we're drowning in sorrow and depression. Or we're drowning in sin. Just like I was drowning in my dream. Because without God's word, we become spiritually out of shape. So each of us personally need to be studying, not just reading, studying God's word. Working hard to understand what God is saying in his word. Praying through how he wants to apply that word to our lives. And additionally, we need to be in church. These corporate gatherings are dedicated to the teaching of God's word for a reason. Now notice Ezra and the leaders of Israel came to this realization from God's word, not in the privacy of their home, their homes. They came to this realization together, reading through God's word as a group. Because our faith and our relationship with God is communal just as much as it is personal. God relates to the church as his bride. God relates to the church as the body of Christ. So both are important. We need to personally study God's word and and pray through God's word. And we need to corporately together as a church study God's word and pray through God's word. Because without the word of God, the people of God become like the world that doesn't have God. Brings us to verses 3 through 5, where Ezra begins to regret the sin of the nation. So when I heard this thing, I tore my garment and my robe and plucked out some of the hair of my head and beard and sat down astonished. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting and having torn my garment and my robe, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. When Ezra hears of the extent of the sin of Israel from the leaders reporting it to him, he is devastated. He tears his inner and outer clothes. Tearing just one part of your clothes was a, was an, a huge sign of mourning, much less both. He pulls his hair out of his head and out of his beard thought about doing a sermon demonstration but then I thought nah I'm not not feeling it I kind of like my beard and hair where it is that is an expensive and painful public display of devastation like they didn't have a whole wardrobe of clothes you're lucky to have inner and outer clothes and you tear it and Your hair and your beard as a Jewish man is precious. You're pulling it out. Now we might think it's weird that Ezra was so upset about the sins of others, not even his sins. But it shows us how serious sin is. How harmful sin can be, even more than we probably realize. We're probably not devastated and astonished enough about our sin. So everybody who truly cared about following God's word, they came to Ezra to hear him speak on it. And when they got there, 
He just sat there quietly all day long. And that says more than words probably could. Imagine if I got up here and said, you know, church, we're in deep sin. And then we just sat here all Sunday. <laughs> no, you can't get up. You can sit back down. We're staying here quietly the rest of the day. When it became, when it was time for worship and sacrifice, Ezra, he had his clothes already torn, so he fell on his knees and he lifted his hands up to God. It's what worship looks like in the time of brokenness, humbling ourselves before God, looking to him for answers. Our own sin and the sin of God's people should devastate us. And when I say that, I don't mean cripple us. We would commonly communicate it as it should convict us. That's the word that we would normally use. But I'm not sure that carries the weight of what this passage is demonstrating. It should devastate us. Our own personal sin, the sins of other Christians, the sins of the church should devastate us. Ever since my son was born... I cannot handle hearing stories of other kids who are sick or who are injured or who are hurt or who pass away. It's like a drill into my brain. Like I, I, like when I see a commercial of, of cancer kids or something, I start tearing up and I just can't handle those kinds of stories because I just think about what if that was my son and I think about how the parents must be feeling. I think of how unfair it is, or it feels to me that the kids have to go through this and how they deserve so much better. And it just, it really does just break my heart. And it's like, just, a, that's the best way I can describe it. It's like a drill going into my brain of how much it hurts me. It's kept me up at night, just like not being able to sleep, just thinking about all the things that could go wrong, you know, with my son. And, and I've been blessed that he's been healthy to this point and right now healthy, but it just... Like, even though I haven't experienced it with my own son, I'm like mourning the pain of the other kids and the other parents who are going through that. And I pray that I never have to experience that. But so many people do and have, and possibly I might. Now, when we hear that sin should devastate us, when, when we read that and we hear sin should devastate us, Many of us will immediately think of all the sin in the world. We immediately think about how our culture is going down the toilet and how things are just getting worse and worse and worse. But notice, that's not what Ezra is reacting to. He's not reacting to the surrounding nations and how sinful they are. He's not mourning the sin of all the other nations. He's mourning Israel's sin. He's mourning the fact that Israel is taking on the sins of those other nations. It's dangerous to be more worried about the sins of the world than to be worried about the sins of Christians. Because we should expect the world to be sinful. What else would we expect? Of course the world is sinful. Of course our culture is becoming more and more sinful. But believers, Christians, believers are supposed to be renewed. We're supposed to be made completely new. Now we know the world needs Jesus. That's a clear problem and a clear solution. The world is sinful because it is without Christ. The solution to that is to bring Christ to the world. But Christians, we already have Christ. So sin for us is an abomination that we would reject the word of the one who saved us. And we would defile the temple of the Holy Spirit that is our bodies. That we would defile 
the body of Christ, that is, our churches. And even before we get there to thinking about the sins of other Christians, we can't, we can't even address the sins of other Christians until we first address our own sins. Jesus commands us to first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Matthew 7, 5. So we have to start by being devastated with our own sin. Why? Because understanding the grossness of sin helps us endure the worst of temptation. Again, we're not talking about putting ourselves down or being crippled by shame. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about real mourning. Mourning the sin, our own sin, and mourning the sin of our culture. Our own sin and the sin of, or not of our culture, of, of Christians. Our own sin and the sin of God's people should devastate us. Brings us to verses 6 through 9 where Ezra remembers the mercy that God has given Israel. Verse 6, And I said, O oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty and for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation, as it is this day. And now for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape, to give us a peg in his holy place, that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. For we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. Ezra lifts up this public prayer of guilt to God on behalf of the nation of Israel. He says he is too ashamed and too humiliated to even face God, buried in the guilt of the sin of the nation. Now you might ask, why does Ezra feel so guilty if he wasn't the one who was sinning? These are the people that were there before he even arrived. Well, personal sin does matter, but so does the corporate guilt of a community. As a community under God, we are partly responsible for the sins of our members. That's what being a community under God means. And leaders, even brand new leaders like Ezra, are even more responsible for those who they lead and the sins of those they lead. Ezra recognizes that this isn't a recent problem, that Israel has historically done this over and over and over again. He sees that these sins have been the reason that God has let other nations conquer Israel all these years. If Israel can't be a good witness to other nations, then they're harming themselves and they're harming other nations. And it's better for them if, and it's better for the other nations if God lets them be taken captive. Ezra acknowledges that God has given them a break in this discipline. He's given them mercy to return back to Jerusalem from exile. Mercy to try again. Even though God sent them into exile in the first place, he preserved them in, in exile. You can see from the ten tribes in Israel that are lost, that's not an accident. Israel should have been lost forever in history, in exile. But God preserved a remnant 
a small piece of Israel all these years and has reestablished them in Jerusalem now and has given them yet again another chance. Realizing God's past mercy helps us take responsibility for our current guilt. On our my wife and I's first anniversary, we borrowed like an RV trailer from my aunt and uncle and parked it at the Central Coast, kind of close to where we got engaged. You know, a romantic thing and all that stuff. You know, wives love that kind of romantic stuff. So we, we, we got, you know, we parked it there and, and we had a really good time together. It was a really great anniversary. But one of the nights I had like a random, I never get nosebleeds, but I had a random nosebleed all over our pillows <laughs> that belonged to my aunt and uncle. And, um, and so like, you know, you can wash blood out of stuff, right? It's, that's a thing you can do. But after everything my aunt and uncle did, like they got us the trailer, they set it up for us. I mean, all the things that they've done over the years, it wasn't even a question in our mind. It was like, yeah, we're going to go buy them new pillows and pillowcases because like we, we, we need to take responsibility for what happened. And uh, there's no use messing around with trying to clean it. Let's just go get them some new ones and let that be that. We were at the time we were like really tight with with money. Uh, if you could imagine me being tight with money and uh, if you know me at all. But we were like we, we didn't have a lot to just spend on stuff. And pillows are more expensive than you think they are somehow. Um, but, but it wasn't even a question even then, even in that mindset, because of how much they had done for us. It was like, well, of course we're going to get, I think they probably still have the bloody ones <laughs> that are cleaned and the new ones, but, but like, it's not even a question. Of course we're going to, uh, take care of this. Of course we're going to take responsibility for this because of how much they've done for us over the years and how much they've done for this, this trip. God has been so incredibly generous with us. When you think about all that he's given us, all that he's protected us from, when you think about all that he's forgiven us from, if we forget the mercy that God has given us, we feel like we should run from our mistakes. If we're not thinking about all the mercy God has given us, we feel like, yeah, I got to get out of here. I feel like Adam hiding in the garden after he sins so that God won't see him or Jonah running the opposite direction when he doesn't want to follow God's word. That's how we feel when we forget the mercy of God. We run from God's correction. We're afraid of God's correction. We don't want anything to do with God's correction when we don't think about his mercy. But if we remember all of the mercy that God has already given us, we run into his arms like the prodigal son. It's a no-brainer. It's as easy of a decision as buying new pillows to replace bloodstained ones. We're convinced that there is no better place to turn to when we make a mistake, when we sin, when we fall. We're convinced there's no better place to turn to than to the arms of the Lord. Not just intellectually convinced, like it's an answer in today's after-service quiz, but like how a young child falls, hurts themselves, and immediately turns to their parent, immediately runs to their parent for comfort. This morning, Samuel, when we were getting ready, fell back and hit his head softly on the, on the bathtub. It was like... You know, soft like hit, but of course, like uh, it really shook him up, and and uh, he started bawling, and you know, he needed to get into his mom's arms for comfort immediately, because he knows that's where the comfort comes from. He he's convinced, not just intellectually. Well, let's see, I hit my head, so now I need to go. Not just that, even though that's true, he's convinced completely in his heart that where he needs to be is in his mom's arms. So when we fall, likewise, when we're guilty, we can be convinced. Lord, I remember your mercy. 
have mercy on me now. Have mercy on me again. Revive me, Lord. Repair me. Rebuild me. Make me holy again, God. The only place for me now is back in your arms. Realizing God's past mercy helps us take responsibility for our current guilt. Brings us to verses 10 through 15, where Ezra requests mercy on behalf of the nation. Verse 10, And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, The land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land with the uncleanliness of the peoples of the land, with their abominations which have filled it from one end to another with their impurity. Now, therefore, do not give your daughters as wives for their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us such deliverance as this, should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with the people committing these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you had consumed us so that there would be no remnant or survivor? O oh Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we are left as a remnant, as it is to this day. Here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. After all that's happened in Israel's history, they disobey God. God disciplines them. They repent. God restores them. And they disobey God. And God disciplines them. And then they repent and God restores them. And then they disobey God and on and on and on. After just barely getting back to, from exile for this very same thing, Israel falls back into the same idolatry of taking on the idols, the sinful culture of the nations around them. They're supposed to be the light nation to other nations. They're not supposed to be taking on other nations' sin. God commanded Israel all over the Old Testament to stay away from the sin of the surrounding nations. That the surrounding nations practice abominations. They worship other gods. They commit child sacrifice. They're involved in demonic activity. Gross sexual perversions. Worse than anything we see in our current culture. So Ezra speaks God's word to Israel again. Do not marry other nations do not marry other nations don't seek protection from them don't make deals with them trust your god to provide for you you don't need to take on the sinful culture of other nations to be prosperous don't do it ezra recognizes that god has not given them the punishment that they deserve for their unfaithfulness how is it possible that after all of this mercy they've received, Israel goes and breaks the same commandments again after all of that? And how is it possible that God has not destroyed them right then and there, brought fire down from sky, from the sky to consume them? How is it possible that God hasn't Judge them right then and there after all of this time. Because God is a good 
and merciful God. God protects his people even from themselves. So on Israel's behalf, Ezra goes before God and Ezra asks for this undeserved forgiveness, this undeserved grace. God's grace abounds and abounds and abounds even after making the same mistake over and over again. God's grace abounds even after making those same mistakes over and over again. Now, obviously, this doesn't give us license to do whatever we want. It's the exact opposite of the point. The point is that we should be in awe of how forgiving our God is. So when we fall, we should immediately turn to him to ask him for forgiveness because we're in awe of his grace. We should remind ourselves what God has called us to do, what God has called us to be in his word. God's grace leads us to obedience. His grace moves us to obey his word. Because you forgave me of so much, Lord, I want to follow you with everything I have. You've forgiven me of so much. Let me give everything I have to you. Let me obey you with every fiber of my being. So when we mess up, and when we mess up again, and when we mess up again, and when we mess up again, let's recognize our sin. And how we do that is through his word. If we study his word consistently over and over again, we recognize the sin in our life. And when we recognize it, we should regret it. It should devastate us. Not cripple us with shame. It should devastate us. We should mourn the sin in our life. And then we should remember God's mercy. Remember how much mercy he's given us. That should motivate us to take responsibility for that sin, for our guilt. And at that point, when, when we've come before the Lord, we request, we request his mercy. And we're confident as sons and daughters of God that in requesting his mercy, he's gracious. And his mercy and his grace abound over and over again and cover us. So when we find ourselves in the position where we mess up, our response to repeated disobedience is just falling at the feet of our God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy to us for your word to convict us of our sin, for how open you are to us coming before you, how you don't just uh, bring lightning down to strike us, but you give us grace and forgiveness. You have our best in mind when you care for us and protect us even from ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for how much you care for us in this way. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus for salvation, this chapter is a good example of how gracious our God is for you. Anything you've done wrong, any, any wrong that's been done to you, he's able to forgive what you've done and heal what's been done to you. If you would like to trust in Jesus for the first time this morning, if you want to raise your hand, I'd love to pray with you. Does anybody want to trust in Jesus for the first time this morning? Those of you raising your hands online, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for these who have chosen to trust in you. 
pray that they believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus. They trust in Jesus to give them forgiveness of their sins and eternal life. Pray that they run into your open arms this morning. That you accept them into their into your kingdom and that they build this personal relationship with you that we all have. We that are Christians, that is. If we keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed for a second longer, if the Lord has shown you this morning where to go when you mess up, shown you the importance of his word to point things out, shown you the importance of mourning sin, if he's shown you how much mercy he's given you already in the past, to help you feel comfortable coming to him. If you're in a position where you're asking for forgiveness to the Lord, we see that his grace abounds. So if you would like to ask for forgiveness from the Lord, if you want to raise your hand, I'd love to ask with you. Amen. Amen, amen. Father, we come before you as your church, as your children, as this community, corporately taking responsibility for the ways that we've messed up, for our sin. Pray in communion with those who are raising their hands here for forgiveness of their sins, forgiveness for our sins. That you know the different situations, you know the different things that have been repeated, different mistakes and we've read your word as a community and we've received your truth and now we turn to you and lift these things up we're on our knees with our hands raised asking for your forgiveness knowing that you've given us so much mercy and grace already knowing that your grace abounds for us and we pray that as we walk from this place this morning you tell us, go and sin no more with complete forgiveness. Walk out of here with victory, with confidence in what you've done here. Walk remembering your mercy for us so that it's easy for us to turn to you the next time we fall and walking with a new excitement for your word. So I pray for those who are raising their hands specifically, but I pray for all of us as a community here together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.